Hey, Brad, do you know what time it is? It's coffee time. Mmm. No. No? Yeah. It's me going to go get a snack time, right? Mm, still no. Okay, so what time is it? It's graduation time. Oh, that's right. Class of 2020, congratulations. That's right. If you are a high school or college graduate in the class of 2020, we would love nothing more than to honor you and recognize you for all of the hard work you've put in. That's right. And so for us to be able to honor you this coming Sunday, we, we need you to reach out to us. Send an email to chase at chase at ourhcc.org. He will be in touch with you because we would love nothing more than to celebrate you and honor you this coming Sunday. That's right. So to all you grads, we say congratulations. congratulations. Hey, Brad, do you know what time it is? It's coffee time. Mmm. No. No? Yeah. It's me going to go get a snack time, right? Mm, still no. Okay, so what time is it? It's graduation time. Oh, that's right. Class of 2020, congratulations. That's right. If you are a high school or college graduate in the class of 2020, we would love nothing more than to honor you and recognize you for all of the hard work you've put in. That's right. And so for us to be able to honor you this coming Sunday, we, we need you to reach out to us. Send an email to chase at chase at ourhcc.org. He will be in touch with you because we would love nothing more than to celebrate you and honor you this coming Sunday. That's right. So to all you grads, we say congratulations. congratulations.
Hey, Brad, do you know what time it is? It's coffee time. Mmm. No. no. No, it's me going to go get a snack time, right? Mm, still no. Okay, so what time is it? It's graduation time. Oh, that's right. Class of 2020, congratulations. That's right. If you are a high school or college graduate in the class of 2020, we would love nothing more than to honor you and recognize you for all of the hard work you've put in. That's right. And so for us to be able to honor you this coming Sunday, we, we need you to reach out to us. Send an email to chase at chase at ourhcc.org. He will be in touch with you because we would love nothing more than to celebrate you and honor you this coming Sunday. That's right. So to all you grads, we say congratulations. congratulations.
Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, let's rise to our feet if we're able. Let's worship our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go.
Verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a, fi as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in, in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Church, 2,000 years ago, the Lord gave us His precious Holy Spirit, the Comforter, our Helper. We rejoice that, that we can rely on Him for wisdom, for guidance. And um, for me, just personally, I'm just so thankful for not only the Lord being in my life, but just in the way He is in our lives and in my life. I wouldn't be able to overcome hard times and the deepest, darkest times of my life when everything seems to be going crazy. Um, I can just be still and know that he is God because he is with me. And um, even right now in this moment, uh, I feel his spirit just comforting me and ministering to me. And um, we pray that the Holy Spirit is ministering to you, comforting you in, this cra in these crazy times. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, we have eternal life, we have this hope that we can rest secure, and we will be with him forever in eternity. So let's sing this next song together. One, two, three, four. Who is the way, the truth, the life? i 
darkest of our days Who is our hope that doesn't fade Who is our courage and our strength Who is the fullness of our faith Only Jesus Only Jesus Who is true is life Only Jesus Christ Only Jesus Only Jesus Who is lifted high Only Jesus Christ Only Jesus Only Jesus You are the way, the truth, and the life You are the blood, the water Hollywood Community Church. We are so happy you're worshiping with us today. My name is Kelly. And my name is Brad, and we are glad that you have joined us online for our service this morning. That's right. So if you're new here, we would love if you could take just a second to fill out the communication card. It can be found on our website. And we promise we're not going to do anything weird. We just want to get to know you and how we can pray for you and partner with you on this journey called life. That's right. And if you've been joining us for a while online, we would love to know who is worshiping with us each and every single Sunday. We want to know what families are joining us. So would you please fill out our online attendance form. You can find the link in our Facebook and YouTube description, as well as find it on our website at ourhcc.org. Just click on the link and you'll be able to fill out that online attendance form. So thank you guys for worshiping with us today. Today at 5 o'clock p.m., we have something very special for our church family. Kelly, ask me what it is. Brad, what is yes. it? I am so excited that you asked. I've been waiting all day to tell you this. This Today at 5 o'clock p.m., we are having our Zoom communion service. We are going to take the Lord's Supper together via Zoom, and everyone should have received an email with the invitation included. And if you haven't gotten the email yet, a couple of things. First of all, check your spam and your trash, because sometimes that's where it goes. So please check that first. If you still don't have one, then reach out to me today at brad at ourhcc.org, and I will email you an invitation for that. And so we want to make sure that each of us are aware of a couple of things. First of all, you're going to have to provide your own grape juice and your own crackers. So make sure that you have both of those for you and your family. And secondly, we're going to have, after we take the elements together, we're going to have a special time of fellowship and prayer, and we're going to go into what is called a Zoom breakout room. And that's where we split into smaller groups, still on Zoom, and be able to fellowship, talk with one another, and have a time of prayer. So it's going to be a real special moment. You don't want to miss out, and that's today at 5 o'clock p.m. Sounds great. We hope you can join us. And now as we head into our offering moment, we just want to take a second and thank you again for your generosity and your faithfulness to continue tithing. You have blown us away yes. with the way that you have continued even through all of this. And because of your faithful giving, we have been able to continue this mission of taking the gospel to our city here in Hollywood and to the ends of the earth. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now we have four ways you can give. The first way is mailing in your offering to our our church you can find the address on the website the second way you can give is online 
The third way is you can text the number on the screen with the mm -hmm. amount that you want to give. And the fourth way is through our app. You can do push to pay. And again, we just can't thank you enough for your continued generosity and your faithfulness as you give. As we come to our prayer time this morning, we are coming with heavy hearts. And we're saddened by the event that happened with George Floyd, mm -hmm. where he was killed several days ago, and actually he was murdered. And this is something that as brothers and sisters in Christ, it should grip our hearts, it should tear us up, it should grieve us when we see a horrific act just mm -hmm. like this. And the church, us as a church, we have to respond to this. The scriptures say in Isaiah 117 to seek justice, to call evil, evil. And in this scenario, we as a church, we have to stand up and admit that this is wrong. It's evil. It shouldn't have happened. And this is something that our African-American community, they wrestle with every day. They walk around with fear in their hearts and their minds. They worry about their, their young sons and daughters that have to fear just going to the street and walking down to the store and walking in stores. They have this fear that many of us don't have to live with. And it's time for us as the church to stand up for our brothers and sisters in Christ in the African community. And it's also time for us to stand out. And yes, we've been praying. And yes, the church has been praying for something to change. But church, it's really time for us to take action and realize we have to now stand up for our brothers and sisters from the African community. We have to fight for them. We have to fight for their rights. We have to help those that are being oppressed. And right now, they are. And so as a church, in this moment, we are going to be reminded of one important action that we each have to take, and that is repenting. Mm -hmm. It's going to take the church to repent of ways where, you know, for me, I'm going to repent for not standing up and saying something sooner. I'm going to have to repent for not finding ways to stand up for, stand up for justice and to fight for those that are being oppressed. And we as a church as a whole have to repent, but also we have to pray that our country would repent of this, that we would be able to come together and love one another and that people shouldn't have to live in fear because of the color of their skin. And so today for a prayer time, we're going to spend some time in repentance this morning. Yeah, and so um, there's a local church called The Font, and their pastor is Pastor Isaac, and he shared his thoughts um, on this tragic event, and he ended his, his post with this, and we just wanted to share it with you. Um, it, he says, we see another slaughter of a black man because our nation refuses to repent. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that's from Acts 3.19. Church, we have to know repentance is not a loss. It's the beginning of something more beautiful, more rich, more satisfying, more fulfilling. It's shalom. And so those are powerful words, and I love the way that he ended it, that when we repent, it's not something where something tragic is going to happen. It's actually the time when God can do something beautiful in our life and something beautiful in the world, that this is not a loss, it's actually gain. And so for the church to rise up and pray repentance for our country, it's begging, it's pleading, it's lamenting, saying, God, do something incredible, change this so that we can see your love in this world, that we could see your beauty, do something that blows us away, that is something that only you can do. And this is what the goal of repentance is, is for us to find something that is beautiful, satisfying, and fulfilling. And so for the next couple moments, we're going to give you and your family time to pray, time to pray for repentance, time to repent for yourselves, to ask God for our country to repent, and to see God heal this nation and bring forgiveness and bring order and shalom to his world. So take a few moments in prayer, and I'll close us out in just a moment.
Father God in heaven, we, we repent of our brokenness. Father, we repent of any thoughts in our hearts and in our, in our minds that are hatred towards someone else just because of the color of their skin. Father, we repent of the, the inaction that we have done as churches, that we have taken so long to stand up and to stand out for African-American communities. And Father God, we pray for those in our world that still harbor this hatred and racism. Father, we pray that they would repent and they would find your forgiveness and they would find your healing and they would find your restoration, Father, and they would be put whole, Father God. And so we pray that our country would repent and we would stand up for justice. We would seek for it. We would long for it. And God, we beg and we plead that you would do something about the brokenness in this world, Father God, so that we would never have to see another horrific act like this again, that, like what happened for George Floyd. So Father, we give this to you, asking for your grace and your mercy. It's in your beautiful and powerful name we pray. Amen. Lord of eternity,
Good morning. Today we have two congregations that are participating in this message. First of all, our Hollywood Community Church family and HCC, I want you to know I love you and thank you so much for joining us in worship today. But we are also joined this morning by the congregation of Cedar Creek Community Church, pastored by my son Mark in Grafton, Wisconsin. Don't you just love technology that two churches can be worshiping together? Well, as we mentioned, as two congregations, we are taking this journey together this summer through the book of Romans. And as your pastors, we are praying that that the Holy Spirit enables us both Hollywood Community Church as well as Cedar Creek Community Church to understand and live out the truth of the gospel like never before. So this morning, we're once again in Romans chapter 1, and today we're going to look at just two verses but two very important verses in the book of Romans. So if you have your Bible, if you have your device there, turn with me to Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 16 and 17. Notice what Paul says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we ask this morning that the Holy Spirit of God would would make these words come alive for us today. Give Give us a fresh understanding of the gospel. Lord, I pray that, that you would light a fire in our hearts and give us a passion for the gospel. Help us to realize that, that you desire to empower us to live victoriously, to live out the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So Lord, help us to understand that today and apply that to our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, these two verses are the theme of the letter to the Romans. Not not only are they the main point of this book, but quite frankly, they are the foundation of our salvation and also the foundation of our sanctification. I would say that this is Paul's declaration of faith. Quite frankly, I would encourage you to memorize these two verses. Can I give you a little bit of homework this week? Would you memorize these verses and allow them to become a part of your mind and also your heart? So Paul begins with this phrase, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You see, during Paul's day, the message of Jesus' death on the cross and subsequent resurrection were viewed with contempt. The the Jews viewed the message of the gospel as a strange cult. The the pagans viewed it as utter foolishness. Paul addresses that in his first letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24, where Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly or foolishness to the Gentiles. But for those of us who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Paul boldly declares that he is not ashamed of the gospel. So let me ask you this morning as we begin, what does the gospel mean to you? Now, please don't tune me out this morning In our mind, especially those of us who have been in church for years, in our mind, when we hear the terms gospel or salvation, we might have a tendency to respond, yeah, yeah, I've already done that. There was already a moment in my life when I responded to the gospel. Many years ago, I gave my heart to Jesus and I was saved. But but I'm afraid that for many of us, It's not that we're ashamed of the gospel, but I would say that we are bored with it. The gospel no longer excites us. It it was a message of our childhood. It was a message 
that we needed before we became a follower of Jesus Christ. But now that we are mature believers, we have graduated on to something else. So this morning, I want to lovingly speak with boldness. In Mexico, we had a phrase, uh, con la corazón en la mano. It, it, it simply meant, let me speak to you with my heart in my hands. And today I want to speak to both of our congregations with my heart in my hands, with compassion, and yet boldly. Because here in the United States, we have created a, a different version of the gospel. A gospel that is different than the biblical gospel. It's close enough to it that, that it's similar, but, but we've kind of tweaked it. We've kind of if I can say boldly, cheapened it just a little bit. You might ask, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, let me flesh that out. First of all, we have a tendency to make the gospel about us. We come to church and we don't want to hear how bad we are. We want to hear a message that makes us feel good about ourselves. And so the, the gospel is no longer about my sin and my daily need of Jesus. Jesus, if we're not be careful, becomes a mean to an end to make us feel better about ourselves. We also have made the gospel about prosperity. You've heard it. I've heard it. God doesn't want you to be poor. God doesn't want you to be sick. God doesn't want you to be suffering. By faith, you can create your own destiny for some reason, that message is so attractive to us. It pervades Christian television. After all, who doesn't want to be healthy, wealthy, and happy? So we've made the gospel about our prosperity. We've made the gospel about politics. We, we have mingled American patriotism with the gospel. Now, now don't misunderstand me. I love my country. But Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could be the land of the free and the home of the brave. And I would say also that we have weakened the gospel. We've made the gospel about a one-time event and not about a changed life. We take solace or comfort in the fact that, that there was a time in our life when we prayed a prayer to receive Jesus but now our lives are powerless and our lives are passionless and the gospel doesn't have the same significance to us that it had before. Let me also say that we as pastors do it as well because we have a tendency to make the gospel about building our ministries, about wanting to make our churches bigger. So what we've done, we've taken the glorious message of the gospel and we've changed it. We've made it to something that is more palatable to us. What I submit to you today is this, that we need a Romans revival of a biblical gospel. By that I mean we need a gospel that connects our Sunday faith with Monday lives. We need a gospel that helps us as husbands to love our wives as Jesus loves us. We need a gospel that helps us to raise our kids to become followers of Jesus Christ. A gospel that helps me to see value in my work. A gospel that helps me to overcome impure thoughts, anger issues, and even apathy towards spiritual things. A gospel that conforms me to the image of Jesus. That's what Paul is talking about here in these two verses. So, so I just want to bring out two points. Basically, we're going to answer two questions today, but basically this, what is the gospel? And then what is the righteousness of Jesus Christ? And maybe I would even add a third one. How can I live out the righteousness of Christ in my life? So notice if you have an outline or you're taking notes, the first point is this. As a believer, you have God's unlimited power available to you. Now, notice what Paul says once again, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God 
for salvation. The, the word power the, there comes from the Greek word dunamis. It is a word from which we get our word dynamite. In ancient Greek, Greek literature, it was used to speak of strength, ability, or power. Let me explain it this way. Remember when you were growing up watching uh, the cartoon The Road Runner and Wiley Coyote? You remember that? Remember Wiley Coyote always had a stick of dynamite and he was, he was trying to catch the road runner and it always backfired on him because the dynamite blew up in his face and he was blown up. Why is that? Because dynamite is powerful. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the gospel is spiritual dynamite, not just for unbelievers, but the gospel is spiritual dynamite for those of us who are believers as well. Here's the way that I have defined the gospel. The gospel is the power of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that is constantly available for you to experience or to, uh, yes, to experience daily freedom from the consequence of sin. Let me say that again. I kind of messed that up. The gospel is the power of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that is constantly available to you and it enables you to experience daily freedom from the consequences of sin. So let me pack it in a way that, that maybe is just a little bit more understandable and helpful for us this morning. The first thing is this. The gospel is not just about the future, but it's about the present as well. As we mentioned earlier, we have a tendency to make the gospel about just going to heaven when you die. We push people to make a decision. We push people to say a prayer. Now, please do not misunderstand what I'm saying today. With all of my heart, I believe that the gospel changes our eternal direction. Because of our sin nature, each of us has a natural propensity to disobey God, and, and that sin separates us from God. We're going to see that, that, that truth laid out very clearly in the next few chapters. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, Jesus came for the purpose of redeeming and saving fallen mankind. It is faith in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus that changes our eternal destiny and gives us the assurance of spending all of our future with Jesus. So let me ask you before we continue today, do you know that your future is secure? Do you know that heaven is your home? Someone has said this, and it's so true that you really can't live until you are prepared to die. And so I trust today that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've repented of your sins, and by faith you have turned to him, and that your future is secure. But I would say that that is just part of the gospel. That's not all of the gospel. Jesus' death and resurrection not only have power to give us victory over the penalty of sin, and one day over the presence of sin, but Jesus desires to give you victory over the power of sin in your life right now. Yeah, the sin that seems to trap you, the sin that seems to defeat you on a regular basis, the one that, that you and I just can't overcome, it is the gospel that gives us victory over those sins. You see, the gospel is not just a get-out-of-hell-free card. It's not just a, a ticket into heaven. It is spiritual dynamite that, that wants to explode through your life right now, making you more and more like Jesus. You see, the gospel is not just about the future. It's about the present as well. I, I would say it a second way. To believe in the gospel is not just a one-time decision. 
but a daily lifestyle. We see that clearly in in verse 16. Look at it with me again. Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let me get just a little nerdy for a minute. The, The word believes comes from the Greek word pisteo. I practice saying that correctly, I want you to know. Uh, That verb is found in the present tense. It's not found in the past tense. Paul is not saying to everyone who has already believed, but Paul is saying that the gospel produced salvation or produces salvation as we believe in the gospel. Once again, Paul is not saying that the gospel produced salvation that one time when you prayed and accepted Jesus. No, he says in the present tense that, the, that believing in the gospel is an ongoing activity. You see, we can translate this verse like this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who is believing presently believing to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now that doesn't mean that you have to be saved over and over again. That doesn't mean that you lose your salvation today and you have to re-believe tomorrow. But it does show that you need, I need, to continuously believe in the power of the gospel and apply it to our lives each and every day. Let me tell you what that looks like for Brian, I wake up in the morning and I stumble out of bed. I don't know if you hop out of bed, but I wake up in the morning and I stumble out of bed. I, I kind of stumble into the kitchen and turn on the coffee pot and make myself a cup of coffee. At some point, I, wake my ma- I make my way back to my office to spend just a few minutes alone with God. The easy thing is for me just to read a few verses and say a quick prayer and then get on with my day. But in order for me to apply the power of the gospel to each and to my life each and every day, I need to recognize my own depravity in the morning. I need to look to God and say something like this, either verbalizing it or in my heart, God, I am not good enough. I cannot be a good enough human being. I cannot be a good enough father. I cannot be a good enough father or husband. I cannot be a good enough pastor. I recognize how much I desperately need Jesus to be the man, to be the husband, to be the father, God wants me to be. And today, I claim the power of the gospel that is available for my life. You see, as a believer, you have God's unlimited power available to you. So the second thing that we see in these two verses is this. As a believer, you have God's unblemished or perfect righteousness accounted to you. Notice notice 117. Paul says, for in it, speaking of the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Or it begins with faith and it ends with faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So as we read this, maybe the first question that we have to answer is, what does the word righteousness mean? We know it's an important word, and we know it has to do with being right. After all, righteousness begins with right, right? The word that Paul uses here is used throughout his writings. As a matter of fact, this this word is found 35 times in the book of Romans. It's translated in a variety of ways. It's translated justice, it's translated justification, and it's translated righteousness. It is a judicial term. It is something that God declares over us. When we respond to him by faith, he judicially declares us righteous. I define righteousness this way. 
Righteousness is the perfect and holy character of Jesus Christ that is available by faith to all who sincerely believe in him. Let me unpack that this morning. We know that Jesus lived a perfect life, correct? We, we often pass over, though, his perfect life in order to talk about his death and his resurrection. But his vicarious death is only possible because of his perfect life. And, and so Paul is saying that by faith, by faith, Jesus' holy character is available for you and it's available for me. I said it this way in in the notes, to receive the righteousness of Jesus means that your standing before God is changed from guilty to innocent. As we've already seen in in Romans chapter three, none of us are righteous, all of us are sinners, all of us deserve to be condemned. But because of Jesus' righteousness and when we put our faith and trust in him, our standing before God is changed from guilty to innocent. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified, declared righteous, justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, this morning, if you have repented of your sins and you have believed, you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are no longer guilty before God. As a matter of fact, he has declared you innocent. You possess not your own innocence, but you possess his innocence. You possess the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says it this way, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Paul actually talks about a divine exchange there. Uh, Our sin is placed in Jesus' account, and we in turn receive Jesus' righteousness. So now when God views you or me, he doesn't view us possessing our sin, but he views us possessing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus today, man, your standing before God has been changed from guilty to innocent. You are innocent before God. But there's a second truth to that. To receive the righteousness of Jesus means that the power of Jesus' life is lived through you. His righteousness is available for you. Let me say that again. Jesus' righteousness is available for you. Let me illustrate what I mean this morning I have a decent singing voice. Some people think I have a good voice. Some people think I have a de- decent voice. My kids, quite frankly, make fun of me, and other people make fun of me because I have a tendency to sing really loud, and I have a tendency to sing out of control. Our praise team hears me. I'm on the front row, and I'm kind of singing loud, out of control. I sing beyond the notes. I do all of that. I have this kind of fake vibrato that kind of lets loose sometimes, and everybody has a tendency to make fun of my voice. But what if I could sing like Jonas? Jonas has this voice that's smooth. He has this voice that is seemingly effortless. I mean, what if I just opened up my mouth and it wasn't Brian's voice that came out. I opened up my mouth and Jonas's voice sang through me. How cool would that be? To a certain degree, that's what Paul is talking about in the passage. Now, he's not talking about the fact that Jesus can sing through you, but he is talking about the fact that Jesus can live through you. And the righteousness of Jesus Christ is not only something that affects your standing before God, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ is something that can affect your daily walk. Paul says it this way in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but notice, Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Catch this today. This might be one of the most important things I say this morning. Spiritual victory doesn't come through effort. I struggled with that for years. I've shared my testimony before. For the longest time, I, I, I thought that salvation was by grace through faith, but then sanctification was up to me, and I just had to figure out how to live the Christian life. And I, I tried, and I tried, and it seemed like I failed over and over and over again. Spiritual victory doesn't come through effort. It comes by faith. I know that sounds paradoxical, but because to a certain degree I'm saying that, that, that victory comes by you stopping to try and you allowing Jesus Christ to live through you. You see, growing in your faith, spiritual victory, living out the righteousness of Jesus Christ is not me living better. I can't do that. You can't do that. We can never be good enough but it's by allowing Jesus to live through me. And it's by allowing Jesus to live through you. How is that accomplished? Notice what Paul says. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. You see, the Christian life is one of faith from beginning to end, beginning with faith and ending with faith. Our life is completely characterized by faith. And then he makes that great statement, the righteous shall, shall live by faith. The phrase, the righteous shall live by faith, is, is initially found in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, the prophet, was, was deeply distressed. The people of God were being invaded by pagans, and the pagans were winning. They were defeating the people of God, and Habakkuk couldn't understand why God would allow pagans, ungodly people, to be victorious over God's people. And so in chapter 1, he basically says, God, why are you allowing this to happen in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, God responds. He says, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it. In other words, here's what God's, God tells Habakkuk. Be patient. God is not going to work in your time God will only work in his time. Do you ever feel like Habakkuk? Do you ever feel uneasy or anxious because God's promises don't happen when you want them to? God, how come you haven't answered my prayer? God, how come you haven't healed my family member of his or her sickness? God, how come you haven't provided for our needs? God, how come you haven't restored my marriage? God tells Habakkuk, be patient. And God would tell us the same thing. Be patient. Don't lose your faith. So here's what God says in verses 3 and 4. In verse 3, he says, though it tarries, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. And then notice this phrase. But the righteous shall live by his faith. <laughs> that is such a great verse. It's repeated three times in the New Testament. It's found here in Romans chapter 1. It's found in the book of Romans, or excuse me, in the book of Galatians. And it's also found in the book of Hebrews. What is Paul talking about? He's talking about learning to live by faith. I say it this way, to receive the righteousness of Jesus means you walk by faith and not by sight. We always want to have all the answers. We want to know exactly what God is doing in our life. What are God's plans? How is God going to provide? What is God going to do? And we don't 
always walk by sight. We walk by faith. Those are Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. You see, the life of faith is, is not something that comes natural to us. Quite frankly, it's difficult for us as humans. But it's when we turn to the best of our ability by faith and we believe in the power of the gospel, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that his power then becomes available to us and his righteousness is lived out through us. You see, quite frankly, without faith, it's impossible for us to please God. So, so God desires for us to demonstrate this faith from beginning to end in every aspect of our life to, as Paul says, to live by faith as righteous people who have been redeemed by the power of the gospel to demonstrate faith in our lives. That means we don't always walk by sight. We walk by faith. We continue loving our spouse and being faithful, even if our spouse is not a believer we continue living out the truth of the gospel at work, being kind and being loving, even if those around us are not kind and loving. We continue to sacrificially give, even though economically it might not make any sense because we believe by faith that God will fulfill his promises. We walk by faith and not by sight. Here's my walk away point today, and it's very simply this. Every day, you need the power of the gospel. Every day, I need the power of the gospel. We never graduate beyond it. It is not just a message for the unconverted. It's not just a message for the unbelievers. To the contrary, Paul says that the message of the gospel is for those of us who are believing so let me encourage you, recognize and confess your depravity to God. Recognize and confess on a daily basis your need for him. And by faith, claim the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is offered to you. And I promise you, I promise you, when you begin to live that life by faith, you will be so blessed that you will begin to see the miraculous transformation that God is producing in your life. Let's live the power of the gospel. Let's pray together today. Lord, thank you so much for this truth. Lord, Lord this is foreign to us. Father, in, in a culture that, that thrives on physical effort, that, that thrives on us doing our best to succeed, it's so, so easy for us to fall back and want to depend upon ourselves for, for, for us to produce that transformation in our lives. And quite frankly, Lord, when we fail to produce that, we get discouraged, and if we're not careful, we give up failing to realize that the dynamite power of the gospel is available to each and every one of us. So Lord, I pray today that if there's someone listening and someone watching who has never by faith turned to Jesus Christ, that this morning, they're in their living room. Lord, they would bow their head, they would confess their sin, and they would trust, put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And for those of us who are believers, help us to understand that the gospel is not a one-time event. It's a daily event in our life. We need the gospel as much today as the day when we first believed. So we pray that your power, your righteousness, would be lived out through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. i
Justice that goes on with all of our broken hearts, everything that is just filled with sorrow. God, we trust in you, we trust in your word, we trust in the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Father, we long to be with you forever in eternity where there is no more sadness, no more sorrow rejoicing because we are forever in your presence in your perfect perfect presence so father keep us safe guard our hearts and our families i pray we continue to seek wisdom and, uh, father our lives are for you we live for you i pray we be the best ambassadors representatives of your name for your honor and for your glory so we can hear well done my good and faithful servant when we see you so father we love you we trust in you 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Church, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we can't wait to see you next week. We can't wait to see you in person. The 14th is coming soon. We'll see you soon. We love you. Be blessed.